E na hoa makamaka mai Hawaii a hiki aku ini ihau. Mai kape a hikina a ke kukulu komohana. A puni kahonua manakihi eha a mena kole na kea okona papalina. Aloha kako a pauloa. Friends, colleagues and conference attendees from Hawaii to Niihau and to all those joining us from different parts of the world, greetings of aloha to you all. Mahalo a nui loa and thank you to Kahaka Ula o Ke'eli Kolani for the Oli, a traditional Hawaiian chant with which we mark the formal opening of ICLBC 2021 and extend our warmest virtual welcomes from Manoa Ho'ahu and Hilo, Hawaii. I'm Ha'alilio Solomon. I'm Andrea Perez Croker. I'm Jim Yoshioka. And I'm Brad McDonald. We are the co-chairs of this, the seventh international conference on language documentation and conservation. We're so pleased to welcome you to the first virtual meeting of the ICLBC. We wish you an enjoyable, productive conference, and we hope you'll learn new things, make new acquaintances, and renew old friendships. But before we begin, we'd like to take a few moments to acknowledge the land upon which this conference is being hosted. On behalf of the University of Hawaii at Manoa and the Department of Linguistics, I would like to offer our leo to acknowledge Hawaii as an indigenous space whose original people are today identified as Kanaka Maoli, Native Hawaiians. It is our hope that as the organizers of ICLDC, we can uphold the values of Make'e Olelo and also support indigenous communities worldwide in exercising their freedom to reclaim their linguistic destiny. To start us off this morning, we will take a few moments to tell you about the history of the ICLDC, tell you a little bit about what we have in store for this year's conference and present a few well-deserved awards. After that, we'll share some words of welcome from distinguished administrators of the University of Hawaii, and then we'll hear our opening plenary address. As we all know, this year's ICLDC is going to be quite different from previous conferences. In mid-2020, we made the decision to shift to a fully remote meeting in response to the dangers presented by traveling and congregating during the COVID-19 pandemic. While we are disappointed that we are unable to gather in person to share our experiences face-to-face -face in the shade of the Ko'olau, we are grateful that the online venue provides exciting new opportunities for growth in directions we might not have otherwise had the chance to explore. Since we got our start in 2009, the ICLDC has been the flagship conference of our field. It's become a forum for highlighting successes in language documentation, conservation, and reclamation, for working on problems together, and for creating collaborations and models for best practices. Over the last 12 years, our conference has grown both in attendance and in scope. Back in 2009, we expected that maybe 80 people would come to the first ICLDC, but happily, more than 300 people showed up to talk about their work with nearly 90 endangered languages from around the world. For this year's virtual format, we are happy to say that more than 750 people registered for this conference, far more than we would have been able to accommodate in person. Over the years, the ICLDC has also grown in terms of scope. We've come together to share ways to support small languages, strategies for moving forward. We've looked at methods for interdisciplinary documentation, and we've examined the role of linguistic analysis in the revitalization classroom. We've looked for the connections between language and well-being, as well as those between language and technology. And now, here we are in 2021, gathered virtually for the seventh iteration of this meeting. The theme of this year's conference, Recognizing Relationships, allows us to reflect on the vital role that relationships play in our work in language documentation and language reclamation. And when we speak of relationships, we go beyond those that are typically discussed in language documentation and even beyond human relationships, extending our understanding to the ongoing relationships we have with land, both occupied and sovereign, colonial and indigenous, the relationships we have with ancestors, both seen and unseen, ancient and recent, and the pathways we are forging for future generations to have relationships with us living today. We are delighted to welcome distinguished plenary speakers who will address this topic from both indigenous and academic perspectives. First, 
Candice Kalemamo Wahine Kapugala will address this theme by discussing how we can enact a relational accountability that provides a pathway for genuine, deep rooted, and honored relationships that are reciprocated through our ways of knowing, being, and doing. Our second plenary address will take place on Sunday, just before our closing. Wesley Leonard will discuss the future prospects of Indigenous language work, a future where a relational reclamation approach is the norm. We believe that taking time to recognize the importance of initiating and fostering relationships will help to transform the work that we are engaged in to reverse language shift, whether that be as members of Indigenous communities, advocates, elders, teachers, linguists, or academics. And you will see that a substantial number of paper and poster presentations do so from many different angles. We would like to recognize six presentations in particular that were among the top ranked abstracts from graduate students and members of indigenous language communities. These six people on the screen have been awarded our most impactful paper award which is sponsored by the National Science Foundation. We also want to thank the many people who volunteered to review abstracts for ICLDC 7. We are very thankful for the thoughtful reviews. At ICLDC 5, we introduced the talk story session as a way to facilitate conversation. We encourage you to join these discussions and share your stories and your ideas on how we can address critical issues by recognizing our relationships. We will again feature a series of workshops which provide hands-on introductions to a number of topics in language documentation and reclamation. We're particularly grateful to the National Science Foundation for supporting the workshops and talk story sessions. And we'd also like to acknowledge the special review committee, Raquel Sapien, Daryl Baldwin, Megan Lukaniak, and Nick Teberger, who had the difficult job of evaluating many excellent workshop and talk story proposals. And of course, our sincere thanks go to the facilitators of the workshops and the talk story sessions as well. Since the beginning, ICLDC has partnered with Heo Olela Ola Field Study, who offer a unique firsthand experience into Hawaiian language revitalization programs in Hilo, Hawaii. This year, Hei Olela Ola and the ICLDC have decided to coordinate our events together. And there will be two plenary sessions during ICLDC on Friday and Saturday, where our friends in Hilo will take you inside the Hawaiian language revitalization programs virtually. These include tours and live panel discussions about the foundations of the Hawaiian language reclamation movement through Hawaiian medium education. And at this time, I'd also like to announce the winner of the 2021 Delamon Award. The Delamon Award was created to recognize early career language documenters for their achievements in creating high quality documentation collections. The winner of the 2021 Delamon Award is Carolina Gerzech for her archived collection of documentary materials on Upper Napo Quichua. Her presentation on her collection is part of paper Q&A session 5.8 on Saturday at 9 a.m. Hawaii time. The Delamont Award Committee also selected four honorable mentions, Andrew Harvey, Christian Doler, Florian Leone, and Jorge Emilio Rosas Labrada. Congratulations to Carolina and to our honorable mentions. And now for an overview of how the conference will run. Your sketch program will be your guide and give you access to all presentations. You may have noticed that our conference schedule is split into morning and evening sessions, Hawaii time. We did this to better accommodate presenters and attendees in different time zones worldwide. You may not be able to attend absolutely everything, but we hope that you can experience a good sized portion of what the conference offers and attend sessions you really want to. To help in this endeavor, we had our paper presenters upload their pre recorded presentations on our ICLDC YouTube channel, and our poster presenters upload their poster PDFs to our Discord server so you could view them at your leisure before the conference. 
Over the next few days, you will have the opportunity to participate in live Q&A sessions with the presenters to further explore the topics they have shared. In the paper Q&A sessions, up to three presentations have been scheduled during 30-minute slots. Presenters will give a brief one to two minute summary of their talk to remind attendees of their topic and main points. And then a session chair will field questions for the presenters during the remaining time. In the poster Q&A sessions on Discord, you can move freely among the posters, posting your questions in the presenters' text channels and hearing their answers in their voice channels. For more information on how these will operate, please see the Guidelines for Participants section on our website. We will have a number of special events taking place live throughout the conference, uh, the first of which will be our opening plenary with Dr. Candice Gala and later our closing plenary with Dr. Wesley Leonard. Both will be screencast live here in Zoom webinar format, uh, and we encourage you to participate in the text chat while watching and post your questions for the speakers in the Q&A section, which will be answered afterwards as time permits. Our previously mentioned workshop and talk story sessions will be held live as well. Each workshop will be offered twice uh, during the conference and be in either Zoom webinar or Zoom meeting format, depending on the presenter's preferences. We will likely be recording one of each workshop session to add to our archives. If you are at one and you do not wish to have your video or audio recorded, we recommend having them off and participating in the chat instead. For talk story sessions, the emphasis is on deep discussion of meaningful topics in language documentation and revitalization. And as such, these are the only sessions we place an attendance cap on. Most sessions will take up to 30 participants. However, if the presenters have given their okay, the limit might may be a little bit higher. Attendance is first come, first served. Uh, uh, if a talk story session is full, we recommend going to an alternate session or trying to attend later. Each talk story session is offered three times uh, during the conference. Due to their often personal and sensitive nature, talk story sessions are never recorded during ICLDC. We wanted to mention that in Zoom rooms one and two, where the majority of our plenary sessions and sign language presentations will take place, we will have live interpreters and captioners on hand from Isle Interpret. In our other rooms, we will have Zoom auto captioning on. Uh, attendees can turn closed captioning on or off, given their preference in all of these rooms. Speaking of sign languages, we have a special panel on Complex Dynamics and Relationships in Sign Language Documentation that will take place here in Zoom Room 1 later today. One of the things we will sorely miss from the face-to-face -face conference is the opportunity to chat, network, and form bonds over coffee or at one of our receptions. But we have built in some virtual social activities, which we hope will satisfy. During non-presentation times, we will be having hula lessons on Thursday and Friday, as well as our usual graduate student mixer on Friday. And for those who just want to take a break, continue a conversation with presenters, or meet new colleagues, we have our virtual lounge open throughout the conference day. Finally, if you should require help during the conference, please consult with our guidelines for participants, or send an email to icldc at hawaii.edu so our team can assist you. Before closing, we would like to thank the wonderful Student Steering Committee members who you will be seeing during the conference. This conference simply would not be possible without their help. We are so grateful for their hard work and innovations. We hope you have an enriching and fulfilling experience at ICLDC 7, and before you're done, please provide feedback on our online evaluation form to help us plan for ICLDC 8 in two years. Links will be available in Sketch and sent to attendees after the conference. Mahalo nui loa. Thank you, Jim. In a moment, we will be honored to hear some welcoming remarks from some of our top administrators at the university and college levels. But first, we would like to acknowledge our many sponsors and supporters who are listed on our website and displayed here on the screen. 
We are especially grateful for the support from the National Science Foundation, as well as the College of Arts, Languages and Letters, the Department of Linguistics, the National Foreign Language Resource Center, all from the University of Hawaii at Manoa, and to Kahaka Ula Oke'e Likulani, the College of Hawaiian Language at the University of Hawaii at Hilo. As you may be aware, this conference is part of a multi-pronged effort to support language documentation and conservation, which also includes an academic component. Here at UH Manoa, we are very fortunate to work in an environment that truly celebrates language, be it the ongoing support for the revitalization of the indigenous language of these islands or the more than 25 other languages taught on campus. The University of Hawaii has consistently supported language documentation and conservation efforts, including this conference. Thus, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dean Peter Arnada to welcome you on behalf of the College of Arts, Languages, and Letters. Please join me in welcoming Dean Peter Arnada. Oheo oko ina hoa kipa vale, mina hoa ha ialelo, e ko ko a mai nei, ma zoom wali no, ma mulio COVID, no ka hiku, wa ka aha kuka ka aina, no ka malama, me ka palapala olelo. E ya mai kel velina a yo aloha, a ko ka kulunui o Hawaii ma manoa, a keo hoi, a ko ka mahele ka lai olelo, a aloha kako. Hello and aloha conference participants and friends. I'd like to welcome you to the seventh International Conference on Language Documentation and Conservation. This year conducted, of course, because of COVID via Zoom. O Al or Peter Renata, Kadini o ke koleke no nahana no eao, na olelo, a me kamo olelo, me kakula nui o Hawaii mama noa, ke koleke ho loa i ho ho o no ho no ho ia i ho ne makahui puana o na koleke arts and humanities. Languages, Linguistics and Literature, May School of Pacific and Asian Studies. Ha oli no kuunao i ke kona ia e ho kipa mai ya o ko pakahi na mea i kipa mai ana me ke aka me ke ho maka ana o ke ia ahukuka kao aina au kalani ko i. Kahi e hui nui neo ko na oloea me ia hana malama a palapala olelo e noho ae ala i o ia nei o ka poe 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 honua. I'm Peter Ranada, and I'm the Dean of the College of Arts, Languages, and Letters, a new college in our first year, formed after the merger of the Colleges of Arts and Humanities, Languages, Linguistics, and Literature, and the School of Pacific Asian Studies. It's my pleasure to, to welcome you to, this, to the start of this renowned international conference that brings together you, experts in language documentation and conservation from across the world, to UH Manoa and the Department of Linguistics. Lana ku manao he alo he alo ko mako velina ana aku yao ko mekia ke mekia avava makalapu akalani hoi o yo ho i o manoa ke kihi o ho mahope o i ke hui ho ana ae o ke ia aha kuka mahope aku o alua makahihi ke akaku loa o covid. It's my hope that we'll be bringing you back and welcoming you to our campus after COVID at the next biennial gathering to host you in the beautiful and historically important Manoa Valley, which is on this picture behind me. Let me conclude by thanking you for the work you're doing on the ground activism and scholarly research combined on behalf of the richness of human languages and the many that are under threat and that have contributed so much to the tapestry of the human experience. Let me also underscore and thank our Department of Linguistics, a jewel at UH Manoa and in our college. The work they do and the work that all of you are doing is vital and essential. And for it, I thank you and I wish you a very productive conference. Aloha. Thank you, Dean Arnada. I would also like to introduce a longtime friend of the ICLDC, Dr. Laura Lyons. Dr. Lyons is the former Dean of the College of Languages, Linguistics and Literature, and is the current Interim Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs. Dr. Lyons is also a professor in the Department of English, where her research focuses on cultural studies and post-colonial literature. Please join me in welcoming Vice Chancellor Lyons. Aloha kakahiaka, good morning. It is my honor to be among those welcoming you to the seventh International Conference on Language Documentation and Conservation. 
I'm speaking to you this morning not from Manoa, but from my home down the road in Moili Ili. The IDC has always impressed me in large part because it takes seriously the work of an academic conference and yet does not treat that work in a generic or business as usual kind of way with workshops, talk story sessions, a field school, and a mix of academics, community activists, and practitioners, um, not discrete categories to be sure, the ICDC always strives to enact the values that upon which it is based. The conference theme, recognizing relationships, seems a particularly apt extension that builds on the work of past conferences and yet speaks to the moment that we are living through. The COVID-19 pandemic prevents us from meeting in person, but it nonetheless offers an additional context for thinking through the difficult work of recognizing relationship without eschewing responsibility. In these islands early on, Pacific Islander communities were among the hardest hit by the pandemic. It was not until Pacific Islanders themselves and language practitioners, and again, these aren't discrete categories, were enlisted in the effort not just to disseminate information, but also to help those communities reimagine for themselves important events and practices that build upon their sense of relationship to each other, that the infection rates leveled off and eventually went down. We know that the pandemic is disproportionately affecting indigenous communities and endangered languages. The work that you all do has always been critical, but the pandemic reminds us that the work of language documentation conservation and revitalization has long been a life and death matter. As you think through the responsibilities that attend recognizing relationships, it is my hope for you and for all of us that you will think both in the midst of and beyond the pandemic, that you will consider the forces that shape your relationships and how to work in a reciprocal way given those contexts, and that you will also engage in the collective work of ensuring that those relationships are not fleeting, but rather sustainable and lasting. Work that involves being respectful to and approaching with humility, the crucial and intimate connection between people, culture, language, and the natural world, and most particularly with land. Mahalo to the organizers, and I hope to see all of you at the keynotes and other sessions. At this point, we are ready to move on to our first plenary presentation. After the presentation, we'll have some time for questions. Before introducing our plenary speaker, we will hear some special words of welcome from Representative Kai Kahele, originally from Hilo, and coming to us today from Washington, D.C. E na hoa kako, e na olelo, kulana lana, aloha nui kako. I extend my sincere aloha and mahalo to all of you for your ongoing efforts to document and revitalize our treasured languages. While I have the wonderful privilege of being native Hawaiian and my culture has served as a guiding light throughout my entire life, like many in my generation, I did not grow up speaking Hawaiian. Given the impacts of colonization and the suppression of our language and culture. However, thanks to the steadfast generations of Kupuna, or elders that came before me and the tireless efforts of language revitalization advocates like yourselves, I am proud to say that Olelo Hawaii is alive in my home today. The timing of your conference comes on the heels of us having celebrated Mahina Olelo Hawaii or Hawaiian Language Month just this past February. And last week, I had the opportunity to speak to my colleagues here in Congress about the importance of supporting our world's languages that are central to our cultural diversity and ultimately our shared humanity. For Native Hawaiians and so many other indigenous peoples, our language is essential for our people to live and thrive. In fact, we have an olelo no eau, a proverb that says, ika olelo no keola, ika olelo no kamake. In the language rests life, in the language rests death. If you want to extinguish a people, you extinguish their language by taking it from the ears and mouths of future generations. You take it away from their children. So how do you revive a language? 
the same way they tried to extinguish it. We share it with our children. Firekeepers started private preschool language nests, or Puna Naleo, and in 1978, Hawaiian became an official language of the state. And in 1986, K-12 Hawaiian language immersion was reestablished in Hawaii's Department of Education. These early language pioneers continued to rebuild the fire step by step, action by action. And by the 80s, we graduated our first bachelor's degrees in Hawaiian language and from less than 50 native speakers under the age of 18 to more than 25,000 now self-identifying as Hawaiian language speakers today, our fire still burns and it is growing. These trailblazing Hawaiian language pioneers would not have accomplished all they have without a clear understanding of the importance of pilina or relationships. The enduring pilina they have with each other, grounded in an unwavering commitment to ensure that the Hawaiian language shall live, has no doubt propelled them over daunting hurdles and obstacles. Pilina with other indigenous communities nationally and internationally has afforded collaborative learning and advocacy opportunities. Pilina with leaders in various sectors and industries from education and science to government and media are fundamental to shifting perspectives about the place and capacity not only of Alala Hawaii, but all indigenous and endangered languages. I therefore applaud your conference organizers and leadership for focusing on this notion of Pilina with this year's theme of recognizing relationships. My aloha again to all of you as you work to build stronger and broader Pilina, blazing trails together to keep our treasured languages burning bright for generations to come. Mahalo. We will continue to stoke the flames of Olelo Hawaii month by month, year by year, generation to generation, because, Mr. Speaker, Ika Olelo no Keola, Ika Olelo no Kamake. In the language rests life, in the language rests death, and our resolve is greater than ever to ensure that our languages will live on. Eola mau ka Olelo Hawaii, amena Olelo o Ivi apauloa, mahalo, and I yield back. Aloha, it's my honor to introduce to you Candace Kale Mamo Owahine Kapu Gala, a girl who was born and raised in Pahala Ka'u on the island of Hawaii, graduated from the Kamehameha schools and went on to higher education at the University of Arizona, where she got her graduate degrees in Native American linguistics and indigenous languages revitalization. I know Candace, of course, or Kale Mamo, as also a colleague where, when she taught at the University of Hawaii at Hilo in the College of Hawaiian Language in courses uh, linguistics. Uh, so Kale Mamo is very familiar to all of us here in Hilo. Uh, and uh, I know I always say to Kale Mamo, Kale Mamo, you've lost your accent in from Pahala, you've become uh, a major linguist now. So now that you can speak all of these languages, don't forget the Pahala dialect. Mahalo nui loa kale mamo for sharing your thoughts with us this morning. Aloha nui. Before I begin with my plenary, I'd like to begin with this oli written by Kumuhula, or Hula Master, and Hawaiian cultural and language expert, Edith Kanaka Ole, affectionately known as Auntie Edith. If you know this oli, please join me 
as a way to recognize and acknowledge the sharing and learning that will take place here, recognizing all the generations that made it possible for us to be present here today. E ho mai ka ike mai luna mai e O na me ahuna no e au o na mele E ho mai E ho mai E ho mai e a E ho mai ka ike mai luna mai e O na me ahuna no e au o na mele E ho mai E ho mai E ho mai e a E ho mai ka ike mai luna mai e O na me ahuna no e au o na mele E ho mai, e ho mai, e ho mai e. Aloha pumehana kako. O vau no o Candice Kalei Mamo o Vahine Kapu Gala. No Hawaii ku'u kuleivi. E polopeka hope ma ke kula nui. O kolome pia pele na kania ma kaaina pono i o kala hui masquiam. I am honored to be the opening plenary for the International Conference on Language Documentation and Conservation at the University of Hawaii, Manoa. Mahalo anui to the organizing committee for the invitation to share about the conference theme, recognizing relationships. Mahalo as well for the warm welcoming remarks from across the campus and beyond. My plenary is titled Enacting Relational Accountability to Indigenous Languages and Their Peoples, Communities, and Lifeways. In this talk, I will recognize and acknowledge the extractive and non-relational language work that have occurred and continue in spaces like academia towards Indigenous peoples. Language is culture, an embodiment of past histories, current realities, and imagined futures that is not void of people, land and ancestral wisdom. It is imperative to understand that language is more than a system of communication that can be dissected, torn apart, only to be put back together, but is an encoded and cultural practice that unlocks our full potential and expression. Throughout the world, indigenous communities are reasserting their sovereignty, self-determination and inherent rights to protect their knowledges and languages from further desecration, misuse, exploitation, commodification, and self-promotional gain by academia through academic publications, grants, awards, and recognition, promotion, and tenure. When invited into community, it is necessary to approach our invitation with humility to be fully cognizant of the privilege that allows us as academics and researchers to enter a foreign domain of learning. What may seem an insignificant invitation is in fact a relational response that trusts that our actions and engagement with language will be held to the highest standard, a standard that respects the community in which the language resides, along with the knowledges and wisdom which we as academics may indirectly and directly gain. This relational awareness and thinking extends outward from the language to the speaker, community, lifeways, lands, and beings that are present. Although this may be unsettling, recognizing and nurturing relationships, our connections to the human and the more than human hold us accountable and responsible to all who are present in the work we do. By transforming our practice, we enact relational accountability that provides a pathway for genuine, deep-rooted and honored relationships that are reciprocated through our ways of knowing, being, and doing. Hey Hawaii au, no pahala mai au i kau mokupuni nui o Hawaii, a ka i keia manawa noho au ma keomo lewa ma ka aina pono i o ka la hui masquim. I am native Hawaiian from the island of Hawaii. 
I was born and raised at a time when Hawaiian language programs were in its infancy in hopes to reestablish a once flourishing language. My first introduction to Hawaiian language was through my mom, who was a kumuhula or hula master. Though she didn't teach through the Hawaiian language, the hula, mele, songs, oli, chants, we learned and danced reflected our Hawaiian culture, past, present, and future histories and understanding of our world. I didn't formally learn Hawaiian language until I attended Kalima schools as a boarder on the island of Oahu. I enrolled in six years of Hawaiian language at Kamehameha. It's important to note that I am still a learner of Olala Hawaii. Following graduation, I attended the University of Arizona in Tucson on the traditional lands of the Toan Autumn, receiving multiple degrees. I expressed my gratitude to the NAMA program, the Native American Language and Linguistics Master's Program, where Drs. Ophelia Zapeda, uh, Dr. Uh, Mary Willie, Dr. Natasha Warner, and Dr. Amy Fountain um, were my professors. And at Aldi, other professors that included Dr. Akira Yamamoto, Dr. Susan Penfield, and Lucille Warhamaji, all at the U of A for NAMA and Aldi. And I thank them for reigniting my interest with Hawaiian language and fostering an academic environment where I was surrounded by faculty and students with a passion to revitalize and maintain Indigenous languages. During my PhD program, I enrolled in an international seminar with Drs. Perry Gilmore and Lacey Wyman. The other facilitators at the time were Pila Wilson, Ray Barnhart, and the late Bill Demert. It was an exciting time for me as a Native Hawaiian uh, because I would be able to learn from Hawaiian language educators who have been involved with Hawaiian immersion and Hawaiian medium education from its inception. This class opened up many relationships, such that when I graduated, I returned back home to the Big Island for one year as a visiting assistant professor in Kahakaula, Okeli Koalani College of Hawaiian Language at the University of Hawaii at Hilo. It was an overwhelming and wonderful learning experience for me, and I'm grateful for my time there. I would then move to Canada to begin my faculty position at the University of British Columbia, where I'd quickly learn of similar atrocities that have happened to Indigenous peoples in what is now known as Canada. As an associate professor in the Department of Language and Literacy Education in the Faculty of Education, and the First Nations and Endangered Languages program in the Institute for Critical Indigenous Studies uh, within the Faculty of Arts, I am grateful again for the many learning opportunities and meaningful relations that have blossomed and filled with gratitude for shared time and space, especially for being invited into community to be able to share my experiences and teachings, but to also experience and engage in language, culture, education, and lens. Though my relationships extend far and wide across oceans, deserts, temperate rainforest, my heart remains in Hawaii, my birth sands and the lands where my kupuna are buried. As a Kanaka diaspora living on indigenous lands of the Musqueam, I'm keenly aware of my positionality and the complexity that it brings. The terminology that is meant to be inclusive sometimes also causes more confusion, generalization and or division. Academic institutions and federal agencies may adopt particular sets of definitions that don't necessarily align with Indigenous understandings. With that being said, I use the term Indigenous throughout this talk. I want to direct you to the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, as it will provide some structural understanding of how I am framing Indigenous. I also want to acknowledge that I am not speaking for or on behalf of communities that claim me nor for Indigenous peoples and communities and nations in general. I want to emphasize that there is no singular homogenous Indigenous epistemology that can capture the uniqueness, complexities, nuances, and worldviews of distinct Indigenous peoples. There is no one size fits all. The intent of this presentation is to encourage dialogue regarding relationships 
that results in meaningful and relevant change that has positive impacts on the communities that we work in partnership with. On each slide, I've in included an olelo no eau or a Hawaiian proverb in an effort to provide a summary or additional support. Though I will not discuss this in this presentation, the olelo no eau are meant to help guide, model, shape, and orient ourselves toward relational accountability, which is an ongoing process. In preparing for this talk, I endeavored to include voices of Indigenous elders, academics, researchers, scholars, community members, and language speakers. This effort follows the lead of other Indigenous scholars and scholars of color who advocated for an intervention that requires us to be mindful of our citational practices. Who are we citing? Are they Indigenous scholars? Are we elevating the same voices? What are our reasons for citing the same old, same old? This transformation practice is showcased in Daniel Heath Justice's book, Why Indigenous Literatures Matter, where he states that these important interventions are not only ethical practices, but relational ones as well. He expresses that always citing the same small circle of voices is both harmful to the health of the field and disrespectful to the many fine scholars and writers whose work informs, enhances, challenges, and complicates our broader conversation. And Olola no Eao Nanaike Kumu requests that we look to the source. So let's ask ourselves, who informs our teachings? Who is our Kumu or teacher? And who is our Kumu's Kumu? Through this inquiry, we can follow the intellectual genealogy that has informed our methods and practices. As I share my mana'o or thoughts here about relational accountability, I want to begin by acknowledging my kupuna, past and present, ohana, family, friends, indigenous colleagues, allies, and mentors, as through their support, I am able to do the work that I do. I lift those voices that have informed my practice and language work. I introduce the Kumuhonua Mauliola here as a way to conceptualize our physical connection as human beings to each other and to the more than human, the seen and the unseen, the plant beings, mountain beings, water beings, rock beings, and so forth. This is a way for us to recognize how we are connected. What and who are we responsible for and accountable to? and how these deeply embodied and embedded connections are personified through our way of being. The image you see here depicting the Kumuhonoa Maoliola is published in a 2018 book chapter titled Distinctive Pathways of Preparing Hawaiian Language Medium Immersion Educators, co-authored by Kanaka Maoli scholars, Dr. Keiki Kawai'aia and Dr. Makalupua Allencaster. At the core of the philosophy's foundation lies the Mauli Hawaii, the unique life force which is cultivated by, emanates from, and distinguishes a person who self-identifies as a Hawaiian. Written in Hawaiian, the Kumuhunua Mauliola has been published with explication in four other languages, Japanese, French, Spanish, and English, for a wider audience. However, the statement abounds with language and terms rich in Hawaiian cultural meaning and nuances not easily explained in English and beyond the scope of the publication. The Kumuhonu Mauliola emphasizes three areas, the Mauli of a person, which in turn consists of four elements, Ka'au Ao Pili Uhane, the spiritual element, Ka'au Ao Olalo, the language element, Ka'au Ao Lavena, the physical behavior element, and Ka'au Ao Ike Kuuna, the traditional knowledge element. Second, the connecting centers of the Maoli. Piko E, the fountainal or spiritual connections. Piko O, the navel, passively inherited connections. And Piko A, the reproductive organs, 
actively created and inventive. And three, the places where our Maoli are expressed, honua ieve, ties of family and kinship, honua kipuka, ties of the community, and honua ao holoakoa, the entire world. Although these aspects of Hawaiian philosophy underpin Hawaiian language medium education and are instrumental in cultivating new Hawaiian language speakers, we may find that this philosophy is similar to that of other indigenous peoples. We can see that through the Kumupunoa Mauliola that we have deep kinship relations that connect us to each other, to the land, the water, the animals, and to the more than human. Let's begin with relational accountability. According to Anishinaabe scholar Nicholas Rio, he states in his article, that relational accountability references the kin-centric beliefs among many indigenous peoples, which holds that people are dependent on and related to everything and everyone around them. And this includes air, water, rocks, plants, trees, animals, and the more than human. As an academic and researcher, I am not only responsible for nurturing and maintaining my relationships with my communities in Hawaii, but to Indigenous communities that I have been invited into to work with. Rio goes on to say that relational accountability also would include his non-human network of relations. Dr. Enrique Salmon shares in his article that kin-centric ecology pertains to the manner in which indigenous people view themselves as part of the extended ecological family that shares ancestry and origins. It is an awareness that life in any environment is viable only when human, humans view the life of surrounding them as kin. The kin or relatives include all the natural elements of an ecosystem. Indigenous people are affected by and in turn affect the life around them. A cultural mode of kin-centric ecology is presented that illustrates Indigenous relationships with the natural world. The cultural model of nature excludes, excuse me, the cultural model of nature includes humans as one aspect of the complexity of life. Why is relational accountability important and necessary? Why is it something that needs to be discussed, articulated, and understood? Recognizing relationships, after all, is the theme of this conference. Rio continues by saying that the principle of relational accountability emerged primarily as an indigenous counter narrative that questions extractive modes of research. Is he referring to extractive modes of the past, present, or future? In 2009, I attended the first ICLDC as a doctoral candidate to present a poster on language revitalization, technological developments among indigenous communities. I remember being excited to meet scholars that I'd only read about some from Hawaii, some from beyond. As I reflect back to that time, this would be my second conference during my doctoral program that I would attend. I didn't see many Native Hawaiians present. I was among the few. Nevertheless, I was eager to share my work on technology. During my poster session, I had a handful of people stop by for a chat. Two conversations stand out until today. An older white male academic stopped by. We chatted and I asked about the work he engaged in. This is when time stood still for me. In the conversation he shared with what I would deem as unethical practice and knowledge extraction. As a young native Hawaiian woman and emerging scholar, I had heard about these non-relational practices, but didn't think that it still occurred. I mean, it was 2009. But I was naive. 
While he spoke, he divulged more, and my mind was rushing to determine whether I should speak up and against what he was doing to the community he works, or should I just remain quiet as I was just a student? I felt a knot in my na'o. My temperature rise, my heart beating outside of my chest. This wasn't a place for me to be silent. I confronted him and stated that his practice or the practice that he's engaging is, is unethical and disrespectful. This part of the conversation didn't last too long. He didn't seem to bo be bothered by it and later would say that he teaches this practice and we can say behavior to his students. I was aghast. He left. I was thinking, was this real? Did this just happen at this language conference in the 21st century? Yes, it did. Five minutes later, another person stopped by and lo and behold, it happened again. I wanna make a note that this is not a reflection of the conference itself or of the organizing committee, but rather an indication that knowledge extraction continues and may be hidden and disguised in ways that we would not otherwise recognize. It is necessary for us to recognize that knowledge extraction and non-relational language work have occurred and continue among academics and researchers in places like our own institutions and places of employment. There are very pub public accounts that identify research institutions that have exploited indigenous communities for the sake of scientific research with the purpose and intention to write and publish articles, chapters, and books and to obtain further grants. This has of course caused concern for indigenous peoples and communities to work with academics and researchers. As academics, we, we know the line all too well, publish or perish. So I asked to what extent will we go to be promoted, to be tenured, to move up the ranks? It should not, and I repeat, should not be at the expense of indigenous peoples, communities, lands, and likewise. So let's ask ourselves: do we say that we work on and for community or with and in partnership? with community. What words or terms do we use to describe those that we work with in language? Do we say language holders, language speakers, subjects, consultants, informants, or research participants? Maybe there are other words that we use. Though we may be entrenched and guided by our traditional disciplines, our practices do not need to represent a time of the past. We can evolve and change by unlearning non-relational practices and relearning how to be in relation to one another, to the land, and likewise for the benefit of the community. It is not enough to change the language, the terms or phrases to describe our practice or reality, but rather to enact change in our behavior and thinking of indigenous peoples as humans equals, not less than, or flora or fauna, objects, primitive, savage, sidekicks, other, or something else. In Vine Deloria's article, Commentary, Research, Redskins, and Reality, he discusses the ethics of social science research in indigenous communities. He states that my original complaint against researchers was that, was that they seem to derive all the benefits and bear no responsibility for the way in which their findings are used. What responsibility do we bear in the communities we work with? Would our relationship with community and land change if we as academics and researchers actually bore the responsibility and ramifications of our research, good, bad, or indifferent? These practices haven't changed, or if they are, are slowly changing. How do we make deep-rooted, effectual and meaningful change and not superficial surface level change? As an indigenous person, how do we stop the continued in infiltration and knowledge extraction? In her book, Savage Kin, Margaret Bouchak uh, shares 
that any person who meddles with a delicate balance between human and other than human worlds by disrespecting relationships, stealing, po stealing property, abusing power, or otherwise transgressing cultural norms might be rightfully accused of behaving in effect like a social savage. One must move carefully to avoid potential offense since all persons can be unpredictable. Through an embodied knowledge of relationships through physical and spiritual connection, the words of Robin Klimmerer express that cultures of gratitude must also be cultures of reciprocity. Each person, human or not, is bound to every other in a reciprocal relationship. Just as all beings have a duty to me, I have a duty to them. If an animal feeds, if, if an animal gives its life to feed me, I am in turn bound to support its life. If I receive a stream's gift of pure water, then I am responsible for, for returning a gift in kind. An integral part of a human's education is to know those duties and how to perform them. In Hawaii, land is critical on the foundational base that sustains kanaka, or people, mo'omeheo, culture, ike, knowledge, and olalo, language. The aina, or that which feeds us, holds, knows, and tells the true stories of our past, present, and future. This painting by Marilyn Kahalevai is a depiction of an ahapua, or land division, a tract of land that extends from the mountain ridges and summits to the coral reef, in a sense, from Mauka to Makai, from mountain to sea. The Ahapua'a, the Ahapua'a was a self-sustaining unit whereby the community lived in balance off the bounty from the land and the sea. In our current settings, the practice of aloha aina demonstrates and embodies a Hawaiian way of life, being and doing that has a deep and profound love for the land. These connections between people, land, air, sea, life forms, and the more than human signify respectful, relational and reciprocal relationships. If we take care of the land and sea, it will take care of us. Vine Deloria states, when the domestic ideology is divided according to American Indian and Western European immigrant. However, the fundamental difference is one of great philosophical importance. American Indians hold their lands, places as having the highest possible meaning and all their statements are made with this reference point in mind. The earth is a gift that keeps on giving. That is if we care for it. Robin Kimmerer, poses the following questions in her book, Braiding Sweetgrass. How in our modern world can we find our way to understand the earth as a gift again, to make our relations with the world sacred again? Can we behave as if the living world were a gift? Gifts from the earth or from each other establish a particular relationship, an obligation of sorts to give, to receive, and to reciprocate. If Aina is what provides us sustenance, why would we do anything but honor, care, and respect for that which gives us life and health? If you harm the language, you harm the people. If you harm the people, you essentially harm the land. As we move towards relational accountability, I draw upon Glenn Coulthard as he speaks of the land and our relationship to it. Indigenous struggles against capitalist imperialism are best understood as struggles oriented around the question of land. Struggles not only for land, but also deeply informed by what the land as a mode of reciprocal relationship, which is itself informed by place-based practices and associated form of knowledge but it ought to teach us about living our lives in relation to one another and our surroundings in a respectful, non-dominating and non-exploitative -exploitative way. 
by understanding the connection indigenous peoples have to land and all that is part of it, we can begin to really learn about the intimate kin relations and why they matter and how they nurture our well being. There are deeply embedded cultural practices in our communities that acknowledge the human, animals, and the more than human relations in a fluid but consistent way where we all live in harmony and in balance. These relations and the stories it generates need to continue to nurture the land reciprocate its abundance so that we can learn from and live with the land. Daniel Heath Justice shares that kinship is like fire. It is about life and the living. It's not something that is in itself so much as something we do, that, and that is actively, thoughtfully, respectfully. He goes on to say that relationships imply presence and requires participation. Can we say that as academics and researchers that we are present and participatory? And are our relationships only to the human or does it extend beyond the human? In Amanda Holmes's doctoral dissertation, she writes of the Kanyeka and Haudenosaunee languages, knowledges, teachings, philosophies, epistemologies, and ethical systems that exist in relation to the living presence of lands and the natural world, ancestral homelands, the presence of ancestors and ancestral knowledge, collective narrative memory from within places of ancient relationship and meaning. Conceptualizing and contextualizing in new ways from different centers, a critical framework for renewing relationships to language and cultural knowledge deepens the healing, regeneration, and possibilities for the resurgence of community. Renewing our relationships to language, learning our language, participating in land-based learning is good for our soul. Alan Ace Goodwill and I co-created this image of the weaving where we express that our indigenous languages revitalize us. If we take care of our language, it will take care of us. This is our well-being. Renewing relationships also requires us to have a deep listening. Are we engaging in a deep listening? And who or what are we listening to? In working in partnership with community, learning protocols are critical. As shared in this video by the Edith Kanakaole Foundation, Protocol is the hierarchy of relationships between the material and non-material. Hierarchy is already determined by, by the prior generations and the follow through of protocol reiterates the continuum of the thought process of what is important. The Hawaii person has throughout the generations declared that the resources required for living, that is land and vegetation, heavens, ocean, fresh water, and related elements are imbibed with their own level of couple or sacredness depending on their relationships. Protocol established and reestablishes an awareness of relationship between people, place, and things as an and is a conduit for intergenerational thought continuum. It provides a pervading attitude toward ecological sensitivity Animal to Malama and Aloha Aina. It communicates a code of behavior in respect to places, peoples, and things. It is a safety device which reaches into the realm of the unseen. It is a unifying mechanism giving strength to purpose. In Joanne Archibald's book, Indigenous Story Work, she describes the principle she learned from elders in using First Nations stories and storytelling for educational purposes. She uses the term story work, which comprise the following principles, respect, responsibility, reciprocity, reverence, holism, interrelatedness, and synergy. 
she reinforces the need for story work principles in order to use Indigenous stories effectively. We can extend her practice of the story work principles to that of our relationships with language speakers, the language itself, and all of the knowledge that we learn directly and indirectly from. And let's not forget the land and life ways. Are we academics and researchers culturally worthy or ready to take on the power of stories and all of its forms, oral, written, or performative? And who decides if we're ready or not? It is generally elders that are the ones who deem us worthy and ready to take on these responsibilities. But are we willing to be held accountable for actions or inactions? Will that accountability mean anything to us? There is a right or proper way to go about our research. But maybe these stories, along with Indigenous knowledges, are not for us to tell. As we near the end of this presentation, I want for us to think back at the Kumuhonua Maoliola and reflect on our connections and kinship relations. Do we embody these kin relations? These relational practices as described through my citational relations matter because for many of us who are Indigenous, we have firsthand experience of what extraction practices look like and feel like. It hurts us to be taken advantage of and for our cultures to be exploited and languages to be torn apart. It is also known that at times academics and researchers may have more access to language, language resources and materials than some of our own community members. Why is this the case? Language is culture, an embodiment of past histories, current realities, and imagined futures that is not void of people, land, lifeways, and ancestral wisdom. Language is kin. Language is our relative. So I leave you with these questions for you to consider. Is the language work you are engaged in community-led, community-driven, and community-centered? How is your research co-created, co-designed, and co-developed with community? There's a typo there. Does the community see and feel the benefits of your research and work? And who benefits from your work? How do you strengthen and nurture your relations in community? Is your work erasing the people, community, and land from language? How is your work countering erasure of Indigenous peoples? How does your language work amplify community voices? Does your relationship with Indigenous peoples only exist through the language, or does it go beyond? How are your methods and practices accountable within a framework of relationships to land and people? And what does it mean to be an ally in community? How do you build capacity within community for language and cultural work? How are you actively decolonizing your practice? Who gets to share, tell, and publish stories, knowledges, and languages of the community, whose name goes on publications. And lastly, what kind of ancestor do you want to be? I began my talk with an Oli, recognizing relationships, honoring the culture and community that sustains me living as a grateful guest on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Hunkuminum Musqueam speaking people, I would like to conclude my plenary with words and teachings from Musqueam elder, Dr. Vincent Stogan, whose First Nations name is Simlano, as shared in Dr. Joanne Archibald's book on Indigenous story work. Being in harmony with oneself, others, members of the animal kingdom, and other elements of nature requires that Indigenous people respect the gifts of each entity and establish and maintain respectful 
reciprocal relations with each. As we near the end of our time together, I'd like for us to engage in Simulano's hands back, hands forward teaching, which embodies relational accountability to past, current, and future generations. Though we are not able to physically engage with one another today, let's connect to one another through the life force that emanates from within. We will adapt Simlano's teaching and carry the protocols of respect, relationality, responsibility, reverence, and shared purpose through digital means toward connective and collective action. In joining our hearts and minds, we hold our left palm upward to reach back, to grasp the teaching of the ancestors, symbolizing the knowledges instilled imparted and shared and the guidance and help we received from those that are no longer part of our physical world. We are then given an opportunity to embody these teachings and responsibilities of putting this into practice in our everyday lives. We then hold our right palm downward to pass on these teachings, knowledge and values to the generations that come after us so that our teachings and knowledge of our ancestors continue. We recognize our relationships this way. Mahalo Anui. <laughs>